I'm Amy Curran Baker, and um, let's see. Um, this is my second time presenting at Force. It's my fourth conference, so it's nice to see it grow every year. Um, I, as Lisa said, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I had a bilateral mastectomy in 2008, um, and from from there, we'll just get started. Okay, some objectives for this session are that we'll learn what questions to ask your physician when you're making decisions about a mastectomy and reconstruction, uh, to know how to prepare physically and emotionally for mastectomy, to, to discuss common recovery issues that patients face within the first few days after surgery, and to learn how to manage your acti activities of daily living during the first weeks after surgery. Uh, we'll become familiar with mastectomy aftercare issues like scar massage, implant massage, exercise, and being fitted for a prosthesis, and learn how to identify uh, issues with healing and post-mastectomy complications. Now, did anyone here go to the uh, complications workshop that was before the lunch? Okay, that was great. And um, they went over a lot of the common conditions, so that's at the end, and if we have time, we'll get to those. Otherwise, we might just breeze through some of those. Okay, my story. There's supposed to be a picture here, but for some reason, it didn't. It didn't come out. Um, so I was. I'm from a family with a fairly long history of breast cancer. My grandmother had breast cancer. My mom had breast cancer and colon cancer. My maternal aunt um, passed away from breast cancer in her 40s, um, and so I have. There's three older sisters. And I was 39 and with two little girls and um, kind of just going about life, very busy, working full time, trying to take care of a house uh, and a family and wasn't really paying a lot of attention to my own personal health. Um, luckily, my sister Linda was and she, um, we, we had a family gathering, my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, and she told me that she was, kind of sprang it on me, that she was coming uh, east, she was living in Hawaii at the time, to have a bilateral, a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. Now we are not um, known BRCA1 or 2 carriers, We're, um, we, we, we both tested negative. But we do have this family history. So her, she, she had done a lot of surgery, a lot of, I'm sorry, a lot of research. Um, and she had found these doctors in New York who were doing pretty cutting edge type of um, mastectomy with reconstruction, the one step. So she decided that she was gonna have the surgery and she consulted with the doctors and she came east and um, had the surgery. It just so happened that the doctor she chose we're near where I live in uh, north of New York, but that just happened to be a coincidence. Uh, so she went through the surgery and everything went well and she got good results. And the day I went to pick her up at the hospital, I decided that you know maybe I could get the guts up to go and schedule a mammogram. Um, and so I did before I picked her up. And I went back about a month later for my mammogram and I was totally in a cold sweat because uh, I hadn't had a mammogram since I was 32. Um, and so I sat and I waited and, and I waited and I waited some more and they said, well, why don't you just go home and the doctor will call you tomorrow. So I went home and my doctor called me that night to tell me that most likely I had uh, invasive cancer. So that kind of threw my whole life into a whirlwind, as you can imagine. Um, I decided that I would get the same surgery my sister had. I went to her doctor's, and uh, within a month or so, I had a mastectomy. And um, then I was sent home two days later to recover. But I still had a lot of questions, and I had the best team of doctors that I could possibly have ever wished for. Um, and they gave me lots of information, but I still kind of had questions. Um, and as an occupational therapist, my training is in teaching people, helping people become as functional as they can be after any kind of a surgery or injury or illness. So I knew there was categories of things I needed to know about and I didn't really know, I knew, well, maybe I should worry about lymphedema and, you know, gee whiz, how do I get out of bed? 
because um, this really hurts, and how do I dress myself? So I decided that there was kind of a gap there, and so what I did was I, um, after a couple of years, I, I had gone through chemotherapy, and after a couple of years of sort of bouncing back and feeling good, I decided to put together a resource for women like me who were either going for, through a um, mastectomy after a diagnosis of breast cancer or a prophylactic mastectomy like my sister had so that we wouldn't be wondering, basically. So that's how my book came about. I turned to force throughout my entire um, process before, when I was diagnosed, when I went through the surgery, and Sue was kind enough to allow me access to the message board, so I created a couple of surveys, and um, the women of force actually responded to my surveys, and from their responses, the book kind of came to life. So what you'll see is um, a lot of information, some nice quotes from force members, maybe one of you are sitting in the audience, and um, so here we go. One more thing before I start, really, is that, uh, just a little disclaimer, Every single person's recovery is going to be different. Uh, it a lot depends on um, what kind of condition you're in going into your surgery, what kind of surgery you have, what is your age, what is your general health like. So I'm speaking in general, general um, terms here, and you're, you're going to have to ask your doctor a lot of questions about what your specific situation is likely to be. Okay, so with that, one thing that's important to know is the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998. It says that health insurers that cover mastectomy also have to cover, offer coverage for reconstructive services and certain post-operative complications. Um, this law entitles the patient to reconstruction of both the, the affected and unaffected breast in an effort to create balance and, a balanced and um, symmetrical appearance. Um, it entitles them to some coverage for prosthetic breast forms. It entitles them to lymphedema treatment. Um, supplies are not currently, supplies for lymphedema are not currently um, covered under the law, and that's an issue. Um, and treatment for some other post-operative complications. So just a quick review of the post-mastectomy reconstruction options. First, there's no, a mastectomy with no reconstruction. Second, implant reconstruction implant reconstruction and autologous uh, tissue or flap reconstruction. There's been a lot of information on several presentations about um, both types of reconstruction. So here's some questions that you might want to ask your surgeon. First of all, what are my options for mastectomy and reconstruction? What are the risks and complications for each type of surgery and how common are they? How many steps are there in each procedure? And how much experience do you have with each procedure? So that's a really important one. We heard this yesterday during the reconstruction panel that um, you don't want to go to somebody for one step who maybe does one a month. You know, it's better, if you can possibly do it, to go to the person who's had done 1,200 over the course of his career. Um, do you have before and after photos that I can look at? What will my scars look like? How long will I be in the hospital? likely, you know, how long is it likely that I'll be in the hospital, what kind of restrictions will I have after my surgery, and what are my options if I'm not happy with the cosmetic outcome. How much pain or, or discomfort am I likely to feel, and for how long, and when will I be able to resume normal activities. So getting ready, okay, preparing yourself physically and emotionally. This is what, uh, this is my list for what to bring to the hospital. Um, there's lots of lists. Force, the Force website has a list. Um, these are the things that were helpful to me. Um, loose fitting, elastic waist, pajama bottoms that are silky because they help you kind of scoot out of the bed when you can't use your arms so much. Um, I'm not gonna hit everything, but um, slippers, toiletries, some earplugs because the hospital is, tends to be a noisy place, water bottle, your paperwork is important. You don't want to show up at 5 a.m. on the day of your surgery and not have your insurance card and your driver's license with you. Uh, and your clothing for discharge. So things that I would recommend, loose fitting elastic waist pants. Your arms are going to be a little sore and you might have some restricted 
range of motion, so you don't want to be trying to get into your skinny jeans. <laughs> uh, you don't, uh, an oversized shirt, um, slip-on shoes, and if your doctor has requested that you get a post-op bra, then maybe you've chopped for it in advance. Some, some will not re have you get a post-op bra or they'll provide it. Or maybe you won't have a post-op bra. Other things you can do to prepare. Get yourself your prescriptions filled ahead of time, if at all possible, and ask your doctor about post-op restrictions. This one is very important. Um, set up your home and your recovery area accordingly. And um, we talked about the bra, and practice getting in and out of bed ahead of time. Because if you think about it, if you're having a bilateral mastectomy, your arms are probably going to be sore, and you're not really going to be able to use them to push and pull yourself out of bed. So it's a good idea to practice. So this is Jill. In preparation for surgery, I paid attention to my usual activities for a couple of weeks. Uh, imagining myself with post-op restrictions, I made lists and then stocked up on non-perishable supplies, bought smaller lightweight packages of some things, dog food, laundry detergent, and put things I would need on a regular basis in low cupboards so I wouldn't have to climb in a, on a stool when I couldn't raise my arms. And the best tip if you can manage it is have someone else do everything. So this is um, more about the emotional preparation for mastectomy. So this is me, <laughs> and um, I'm actually not thinking about my mastectomy here. I'm thinking about my 20-year high school reunion. <laughs> 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 but I was, I was similarly stressed out about that. So here are some, just a few suggestions that came from forced women who had gone through mastectomy. Write in a journal or blog about your experience. Read books about women who have been through similar types of experiences. Exercise, do yoga, guided imagery. That was something Dr. Hurley mentioned this morning. Turn to the force message boards. I can tell you that I was on the force message boards every day many times. I had kind of a cohort of people that I went through surgery with and then later chemo. Um, you can attend local force meetings. And as much as you can, communicate with other women who are going through what you're going through. And then for counseling and support groups, there's the American Psych Psychosocial Oncology Association. And these are um, psychologists and social workers who specialize in working with clients who um, are going through cancer. Join a support group. This is Michelle. I didn't think I'd need one, but the friendships I developed are great. There really is a need to talk to others who can relate to what you're going through. The tough times, as well as laughing at the things that others could not relate to. So here's your big day. The first 24 to 48 hours. Now, uh, what to expect when you wake up from surgery. First, you'll probably have a PCA pump. That's that little button that you hold. If you've ever had surgery, you probably had it. And that allows you to control how much um, pain medicine you're getting. There is a lockout interval so that you can't overdose yourself. So when you're feeling pain, you just push the little button. And it's important to stay on top of it because in general, it's easier to um, get your pain under control if you catch it early. Um, you'll have on compression boots. These are just little boots that they put around your calves that inflate and then deflate. Um, you'll have an incentive spirometer just to see what your lung capacity is after surgery. There may be a Doppler ultrasound if you've had a flap type surgery to make sure the blood is flowing through and you'll be getting your vitals monitored. You might have some, you probably feel some numbness in your chest, you, even under your arms, maybe a little bit on your back. Feel stiff and sore, groggy from the anesthesia. Maybe you'll have a sore throat from, because you were intubated during the surgery. And then this is my friend Lynn, actually. She said, I didn't realize how much the implant would feel like a brick lodged in my pec muscle. I wasn't prepared for the extent of numbness I experienced. She had, um, I guess, a direct implant. So getting out of bed. So after expander or implant surgery, probably within 3 to 12 hours, is what the women from FORCE told me. I think there is a range. And then after a flap 
reconstruction probably the next day. Usually that surgery is a bit longer. So things to remember when you're getting out of bed. Always have a nurse with you. No pushing or pulling to move to a sitting position. You should sit up at the edge of the bed. We call that dangling because you need to give your, your body some time to adjust. When you're lying flat on your back for a while, your heart doesn't have to work that hard to um, pump the blood. But if you sit up quickly, you might feel a little bit lightheaded. So you're going to sit up first at the edge of the bed for a couple minutes. Um, walk with the assistance of another person and in the, ba in the bathroom keep your hands on a grab bar at all times because you're still a little woozy from the anesthesia and safety first. Okay, so some things that you might have attached to you. Um, I had a little fanny pack with a, a little marcane ball inside and it had teeny tiny tubes that went up into my, in, um, into my breasts just to offer a little bit more um, a little bit more numbing uh, to deal with the pain. I had drains, I had four drains, and I had on a surgical bra. This will differ for everybody. You might not have a surgical bra on. You might have some sort of a compression wrap. Pain control. It's important to, to be able to state what your pain rating is for the nurses in the hospital. Um, pain is rated on a scale of zero to 10. Zero is the worst pain ever. I mean, zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain ever. Be proactive with your pain meds. I mentioned that before. And if the pain meds cause you to feel nauseous, which does happen, just ask for um, an anti-nausea med. Hydration is very important. Narcotic pain meds can cause constipation. Uh, make sure you drink lots of water. Okay, so the key challenges in the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery, reaching for things, getting out of bed, getting comfortable in bed, and managing in the bathroom. Uh, I was in, this is E, I was unable to do anything myself except push that wonderful bed adjuster button the first day. Second day, I was able to get to the bathroom myself with someone at my side. I was able to use the patient control morphine pump wonderfully. Okay, so preparing for discharge. So in general, and this is not a hard and fast rule, when you have no con reconstruction implant or expander reconstruction, probably have a two to three day hospital stay. For flap reconstruction, it might be a bit longer. As you prepare for discharge, it's so important to advocate for yourself. Um, one of the most important things you'll need to do is ask your doctor, what are your precautions? And these are the do's and don'ts for when you go home, what are you allowed to do? Um, precautions usually will include things like a weight limit for lifting. Mine was five pounds, I believe. Arm range of motion. How high are you allowed to uh, lift your arms? And mine was not above shoulder level. And what can you do? Can you shower? Can you drive? Are you allowed to vacuum? Um, you should be getting information about your post-op meds. Wound care, if you're going to be asked to do anything on your own at home how to care for your drains, what are the signs of infection that you need to look for, and when is my first post-op appointment. And so if you don't feel ready to go home, you can ask about visiting nurse services. You can ask about OT or PT to help you get to a point where you feel functional enough to go home on your own, or to have OT and PT at home. And um, you can consider using durable medical equipment for safety, like a shower seat, a handheld shower, grab bars, a non-skid mat. This is Sue. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing as too much information, even though some may seem overwhelming at the time. My only regret is not pushing for more details ahead of time. I would not have changed what I did, but I would have made some of it, it would have made some of it easier to cope with. So here's your recovery at home. So foods that you should try to eat because they promote good wound healing. You want a diet that's rich in protein, things like beans, lean meat, poultry, fish, vitamin C, broccoli, cauliflower, leafy greens, um, vitamin A, carrots, leafy greens, butternut squash, cantaloupe, apricots. Okay, here's some key strategies for um, infection prevention. Use antibacterial soap. Wash your hands often. Don't bathe until you're cleared by your physician. 
Um, I wasn't allowed to bathe until my drains came out on the ninth day. It was a very hot April, <laughs> so that can be tough. Um, take antibiotics as prescri prescribed and insist that your caregivers wash their hands. And A number one, never ever clean inside your drains. So red flags to watch out for in the healing process. Pain at the incision site, redness, warmth to the touch, an, a foul odor, discharge from your wound site, or fever. So this is about drain management. So in this first little picture, this is what the drain looks like, the one on the far left. Um, and it's attached to little tubes that can be as long as about 30, 36 inches, and they come out of your incision sites. And um, you basically, you empty them three or four times a day and keep track of how much your output is. So the purpose of the drain is to remove excess blood and fluid after surgery, and they're typically drained three to four times a day. <coughs> this is Dee. She said, I had my husband and mom empty the drains the first few times, but afterwards I was doing it on my own. It was very easy. Stages of draining. I'll just go quickly through these. Uh, sanguinous fluid is the, in the beginning. It's more like the bloody discharge. After a couple days, it turns to pinkish orange, and that indicates that healing is occurring. And then eventually, when they're getting close to being ready to come out, it's more straw-colored and clear when the drains are getting ready to come out. So what you need to expect, you need to keep track of how much fluid is draining from each drain. Um, it should gradually decrease over time. Usually, your physician will remove a drain when it's producing less than 25 to 30 cc's per day. There is a drainage log, and that picture didn't come out. Um, never attempt to clean inside your drains, the tubing or the container. OK, some possible red flags to report. Increase in drainage that it may indicate that you're being too active, and you need to slow it down a little. Yellow, thick, cloudy, or, or foul-smelling discharge, um, or if your drain falls out. But a good rule of thumb is, if you're questioning that something isn't right, just call your doctor. OK, bed mobility and sleeping. During recovery, I slept in bed, semi-reclining on a stack of pillows. It took two to three nights to work out how to get the pillows just right. I wish I'd experimented before the surgery, as dealing with the pillows afterwards was a source of considerable frustration. I could have experimented before when I had better mobility to adjust things. So bed mobility is basically just moving in bed. So you want to practice, as I mentioned before, bed mobility techniques ahead of time. Bear in mind that you will have limited use of your arms. And if you've had a surgery that involved your tummy, you're also going to probably have some pain there. Options for sleeping is lots of pillows or a foam wedge, a recliner. Some people rent a recliner from a local um, pharmacy through a local pharmacy, or this leech co back and belly pillow. A lot of forced women told me that they really liked that. And there it is. OK, so functioning after surgery. These are some of the high points that we're going to hit. So your activity level after discharge will be different for every single person. Variables will include your pre-op health and your fitness level and any surgical complications. I can tell you that when I had surgery, I I, am not, I was not in the greatest shape ever, but I wasn't in awful shape either. And I really struggled the first two weeks, um, really even to just move around my house. Now, I know someone who's a marathon runner, and she was out running in two weeks. So as you can see, there's a huge range of <laughs> what we'll call normal. OK. Energy conservation is very basic. It's a set of Common sense principles for reducing the amount of energy the body expends on a daily basis, um, doing things like basic self-care, work, and home management tasks. These, tasks. these techniques can be incorporated into your daily life during the first days and weeks after your surgery. So very generally, they are pace yourself, don't rush, plan ahead, organize, schedule, day, schedule your day ahead of time. 
gather all your supplies together before you start an activity like dra uh, dressing, bathing, cooking. Take frequent rest breaks. Alternate light and heavy tasks throughout the day and week. Sit while you're working whenever possible and don't overuse your arms because that can cause fatigue. When you're bathing, you have to check with your physician about post-op restrictions. So if you're not allowed to shower for nine days, uh, sponge bathing, using baby wipes, dry shampoo, wash and blow out at a salon, or get help washing your hair in the sink. This is E again. I had my husband wash my hair the first week I was home, and that did wonders for me. I purchased a shower seat to sit on so he could wash me and my hair without getting my incisions wet. Once you're, once you're allowed to bathe, you're going to use your energy conservation techniques, gather all items for dressing and bathing in one area before you start. Sit while bathing. Use a handheld shower or shower stool if you need one. Don't use water that's too hot because that will increase fatigue and could cause you to have hypotension or fainting. Uh, after bathing, sit while drying yourself and always have somebody nearby the first time you bathe. Be careful about using lotions, powders, deodorants, and your incisions until they're fully healed. Dressing. Um, choose loose-fitting clothing, button, zip front shirts, elastic waist pants, and slip-on shoes. Again, um, I'll just skip through a couple of these. Gather clothing and have it within arm's reach. Most, most of you here will be having a bi would be having a bilateral surgery. Um, so I can skip number two. Dress your upper body first because that takes more energy. If lower body dressing is difficult, ask an OT about different devices you can use, like a reacher, a saucade, and a dressing stick. So where do you put the drains? Um, some people use a mastectomy camisole with drain pockets, a fanny pack, or attach to your bra. I used a fanny pack. Do not attach the drains to your pants. Last time I told everybody why not to address, put the, the drains on your pants, and they all gasped, so I'm not going to say it this time. <laughs> okay, home management. Uh, you're going to put frequently used items. This is something you can do ahead of time. Put frequently used items at waist level by items that are smaller in size, like milk in smaller containers, because you're not going to be wanting to hold a big gallon jug. Cook and freeze meals ahead of time. Look into online grocery shopping and home delivery in your area. I did this and, and was happy to see that um, almost every grocery store in my area would deliver. Um, and set up a meal calendar. P families often want to help. Friends want to help. Enlist family and friends who want to help to sign up to provide meals for your family. If you live alone, buy paper plates and plastic utensils so you don't have to do dishes, get groceries delivered, hired someone to clean the cat box, or take the dogs for a walk if you can't. Okay, cleaning. Set up chore charts for children if you have children. Give extra allowance and let it go. And this is a big one. Um, I won't burst into song about let it go. But <laughs> um, I, I'm not a good housekeeper at all. I have a lot of like um, tchotchke in my house, I guess you'd say. But I do have sort of a little bit of an OCD about organizing my junk. And during my recovery, I just couldn't keep up with organizing my stuff. So you just have to let it go. It won't be forever. It's probably going to be for a couple weeks. Caring for children, infants and toddlers, and older children. It can be really challenging after surgery to try to care for infants and toddlers. My sister Linda, when she had her prophylactic surgery, had a seven-month-old. So um, I asked her actually just yesterday how long she was able to, how long before she picked up the baby, and she said it was, I think she said it was four or five weeks. But there were a couple emergencies where she really had to pick her up. She weighed about 15 pounds at that age, at that time. So for infants and toddlers, get as much help as you can. Set up a mattress on the floor or a futon so that the baby can kind of crawl up with you, diapering on a towel or change uh, or changing cushion on the floor because you're not going to be lifting the baby or the toddler up onto the changing table, and a feeding chair at floor level when possible so that you don't have to lift them into a high chair. 
This is Lynn. Try to rethink how you do things prior to surgery. Set up a diapering station on the floor, a feeding chair with a seat belt on a splat mat, transition to showering for older, old enough children. Get children accustomed to snuggling with you while you have a pillow between your chest and them. Promote your children's independence with great fanfare. Older children, you'll enlist them to help as much as possible. Be very generous with your allowance at this point in time. <laughs> Set up rides, carpooling for sports and activities ahead of time, and just to, or just take a break. Our kids have so many activities going. When I had my mastectomy, I just took a break, and so for a month or so, we didn't go to dance class, and that was okay too. Driving. You're not allowed to drive until your drains have been removed. You shouldn't be on any narcotic pain meds when you're driving, and you should be cleared by your physician before you drive. Once you're allowed to drive, you may want to use a cloth seatbelt cover or a small pillow for comfort between you and your seatbelt. Aftercare, recovery, and complications. So um, this, we'll talk about these issues. Sensation, exercise, being fitted for a prosthesis, scar care, and implant massage. So sensation will vary from person to person. You, may ha you might have itching, tingling, discomfort, numbness, burning. Um, sensory nerves are cut during the procedure, during a mastectomy as part of removing all the breast tissue. No critical motor or sensory nerves are cut during a mastectomy. The sensory impact of the surgery varies according to the variability of regrowth of nerves of adjacent intact nerves cross covering the area. So this is someone who had um, a mastectomy with tissue expanders placed, and this is 12 days after her surgery. She said there's lots of tingling and tightness in the chest, sore and sensitive in the armpit area. Aside from certain areas at the top and bottom of my breast, most of all the skin is numb. This is 18 months after a direct implant reconstruction. I have no feeling in my breast, but in all other areas I do have feeling. Upper chest, below breasts, I, ha I have no problem with the sensation that I have, and I'm sure that no more will return. Um, and this is someone else. The area where the flap was taken, this is flap surgery, is numb. Outside of the scar and the new belly button, the donor site has no lasting effects. When feeling started to return to my breast, it was uncomfortable. I started getting itchy, and then I would start feeling something like a jolt of electricity, almost like when a body part falls asleep. And then the feeling starts to return. I know that I have more feeling in my breast because I found myself pulling away from a hot towel rack without realizing my breast was almost touching. I felt the heat, and I know that it was something that I had not felt for some time after surgery. I actually have very little feeling. Um, Sometimes I get itchy and I can't quite locate that itch, so that can be a little bit frustrating, um, but I have no pain. So exercise. Always check with your physician before you start any kind of an exercise. Keep in mind your range of motion precautions and avoid guarding of your affected arm. So guarding is basically kind of holding it close to you because you don't want to move it, but that can lead to other problems down the road. So three to seven days after surgery, you're going to be using your, your affected arms, both arms probably, as you always would for combing your hair, brushing your teeth. You're not sleeping on your affected side. You're elevating your arm above the level of your heart when you're lying down two to three times a day for five minutes. And while, open, uh, while, ele while elevated, you're opening and closing your hand and bending and straightening your elbow. These are from the American Cancer Society. They have an exercise program that's in my book, it's in the Breast Reconstruction Guidebook, and it's also online at the American Cancer Society website. Um, uh, for breast prosthesis, it's a, basically it's a breast-shaped form that's worn inside a special mastectomy bra or a regular bra to provide balance and symmetry. I'm gonna skip over that. Um, and how are you fitted for a breast prosthesis? You need to find a credentialed fitter in your area, and these are the two organizations that credential mastectomy fitters, the American Board for Certification and the Board of Certification. When you meet with, if you meet with a certified fitter, you can do that ahead of time before your mastectomy. And then your first post-surgical fitting is six weeks after surgery. And again, these would be for people who choose not to reconstruct either right away or maybe they're not gonna re reconstruct. 
um, if they want to have a prosthesis. There are a few companies that have catalogs that say they will just um, talk you through it on the phone, but there's really no substitute for a hands-on assessment the first time you're fitted for a prosthesis. So I would recommend going to a fitter. Um, there's three different types of bre uh, breast prosthesis. The fiber fill is what you get right after surgery. Foam is when you're kind of in the healing stages, and then the silicone forms that adhere to your skin. Um, and these are covered by Medicare and most insurances, although there is a wide range of what is covered and how much they'll cover. There's also partial shapers if you've had a lump lumpectomy and you have some asymmetry, and there are swim breast forms. So Medicare at this point in time is covering post-surgical camisoles and mastectomy bras as medically indicated. For so basically, what your doctor tells says you need, you should be able to get. There's usually some sort of a copay. Uh, one silicone breast form every two years and one non-silicone form every six months. Okay, scar care. You will have some scars. Um, so the purpose of, the, of taking care of your scars is to reduce tightness in the newly healing skin, to improve blood flow to the area, and to produce a soft, supple scar free of adhesions. Now tell your, your physician ahead of time if you're prone to keloid-type scars, um, but you're never going to start your scar massage until your doctor says it's okay. It's very simple. Um, you're just using a little bit of lotion and gently massaging on your scars side to side in a circular pattern. You're going to do a little bit with light pressure and then you can gradually increase pressure. Implant massage. Now the purpose of a, um, Massaging your implants, if you have implants, is to maintain the boundaries of the pocket and to prevent capsular contracture, which was brought up in the complication session. Um, you want to check with your physician for specific techniques. As of the time that I wrote my book, there was not a specific um, list of instructions or any improved instructions from the American Plastic Surgery um, Association. So I think every doctor probably has their own methods. Um, complications, lymphedema, infection, poor wound healing, capsular contracture, frozen shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, and axillary web, axillary web syndrome. These were covered in some depth at the session this morning. I do want to touch on lymphedema, though. Okay. Um, after removal of lymph nodes through sentinel lymph node biopsy or axillary lymph node, dissection, there's a possibility of de developing lymphedema. Lymphedema is a swelling that can occur in the chest or the arm. Some warning signs, a sensation of fullness in your arm, skin feeling tight, decreased flexibility, difficulty fitting on clothing, rings, wristwatch. And how do you prevent lymphedema? Avoid trauma. Gradually build up duration and intensity when performing exercises. Avoid needle sticks when you can. Um, or IVs in that arm. I've actually driven my doctors a little bit crazy by requesting uh, IVs in my foot a couple times. Um, and consider using compression garments for air travel. If you think you might have lymphedema, consult your physician immediately and ask for a referral to a certified lymphedema therapist. This is a specialized training that nurses, OTs, PTs can get. And there's two websites where you can uh, go online and basically look up your area and find someone in your area. So the treatment for lymphedema is instruction and proper skin care, some compression garments, exercise, and manual lymph drainage massage. Okay, I'm going to skip through these. Uh, Resuming normal activity. So everybody's normal is a little bit different. Um, I remember when I was writing the book, one of the women who responded to returning to work, she worked in a liquor store where she had to lift like 40 pound boxes of um, wine and whatnot. So her normal and resuming normal activities is going to be a lot different than mine might be. At exactly five weeks post -pro prophylactic mastectomy with expanders, I return to work full time. I do not recommend full time work until at least four weeks. Fatigue is the biggest reason for not returning sooner. Know your body and listen to it. Variables in returning to work are um, 
types of surgery, complications, type of work you do, is there a lot of lifting, is there a lot of bending, your endurance level, and your physician's orders. Okay, and when you're at home, if you have children, just don't overdo it too soon. Get as much help as you can from family and friends. I was able to lift them after three weeks. I was still pretty exhausted the first couple of weeks post-op, so I'd recommend at least three to four weeks off. Questions? <laughs>